Senate file 1470 has been procedurally matched at the front desk with House file 12 from Chair Houseman. So we will have, uh, so we will first need to put the, uh, the House language onto the bill. The funding element of this bill has already been addressed in the housing omnibus. So the committee is not authorizing any new spending today. And this can be a brief hearing. Vice Chair Olson, would you like to move the bill and then move to substitute the House language? Yes, Madam Chair. I move that Senate file 1470 be recommended for placement on the general register. And I will also move to substitute the language from House file 12 onto the bill. Thank you. All in favor of the Olson motion to substitute the House language, say aye. 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 Oh. No, no, no. We are now working from the language of House File 12. Chair Houseman, welcome back to the committee. Please tell Thank us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, House File uh, 12 is um, once the uh, eviction moratorium ends, we need an off ramp uh, to avoid chaos. We need a plan. You've already noted uh, the fiscal impact was 44,000 but that has, uh, has been carried in the housing bill, which passed on the House floor uh, a week ago. Um, and that's the fiscal impact. I'm assuming you, you want to hear something about the content of the bill as well. What is your, what is your plan, as Chair? Uh, yes, Chair Hausman. Can you just give us Thank you. an overview? So on, on March 13, 2020, the <laughs> executive are we... Uh, issued executive order uh, declaring a peacetime emergency related to the spread of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. He subsequently issued a number of related executive orders making changes that would help keep Minnesotans safe during the pandemic. This included an order which prohibited evictions except in cases where a tenant seriously endangers other residents or is engaging in criminal behavior. That was later modified, uh, but it's uh, the idea was it's impossible to stay safe at home if you are evicted from your home. Nothing in any of these uh, executive orders removed the responsibility for tenants to pay the full amount of rent owed. And that, of course, is one of the issues that we dealt with partly with uh, housing assistance uh, last year. The bill maintains the prohibition on evictions due to nonpayment and allows evictions in cases where a tenant poses a danger to others, engages in criminal behavior, or remains in the property after they've been notified to vacate so the owner or owner's family member can move in. Landlords may not assess late fees when non-payment of rent is due to a tenant's uh, COVID-19 related income loss. They also cannot increase rent more than 6% and cannot increase rent during the peacetime emergency if they have increased rent during the previous 12 months. Just an aside, um, members, it's been interesting to me in the in the debate about this bill and others, uh, landlords seem to have changed their names. Um, they are now um, using the term housing providers, which I think is an interesting uh, change. Um, during the 12 months immediately following the end of the current peacetime emergency, landlords who intend to file an eviction for any reason other than those allowed during the peacetime emergency must provide written notice to the tenant at least 60 days before filing an eviction. No late fees may be assessed and rent may not be increased during that 60 day period. That 60 day period um, is intended to allow uh, a transition. And uh, I'll speak later to the amount of, of federal money that can help us through this um, process. Uh, just uh, a, a point, the eviction moratorium wasn't issued as housing policy. It was issued as a public health imperative. Most of the discussion on this issue by those who want a complete and immediate end to the eviction moratorium focuses on the concept as if it is purely housing policy. That's misleading because this was never truly about housing. It's always been about public health, ensuring that people were staying home to help stop the spread of COVID-19 meant that we had to ensure they weren't displaced from their homes. And at a time when so many came with a distinct and immediate threat of furthering the spread of COVID-19 at a time when cases were spiking, we could not afford that risk. The, um, uh, the research has been done, by the way, areas who suddenly ended their eviction moratorium in 2020 
saw spikes of COVID-19 cases. A study published in November from a team of researchers at UCLA found that between the start of the pandemic and the federal eviction moratorium in September, evictions led to 433,000 additional cases and 10, almost 11,000 additional deaths. So um, there was, for those in 2020 who didn't have a plan, it did have an impact, a negative impact. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, but we're currently still in the tunnel. We don't want to replace a health crisis with an eviction crisis. Um, one additional uh, piece, um, a 60-day notice period after the moratorium ends allows time to access rental assistance funds. Minnesota has $375 million to help assist individuals who have struggled to pay rent or associated fees during the pandemic. While at first glance it may seem like a lot to give individuals a two-month notice before filing an eviction, that timing allows them or the landlords to apply for assistance funds. This way, they are not unnecessarily displaced and the landlord can get what they are owed. Housing instability has a ripple effect to other areas of life. So for us, there's a strong public interest in ensuring housing stability in times when we aren't experiencing a pandemic and even more so when we are. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to present this bill. Thank you, Chair Hausman. Uh, members, uh, are there any questions or comments to the uh, bill authors? Let's see here. Okay, um, Representative Garofalo, would you like to go first or are you? Yes, Madam, Madam, yeah. Madam Chair, if I could, I would appreciate that. So yes. um, um, I had sought recognition on adoption of the substitution of the language, but um, you didn't see it, but that's okay. That's one of the limitations of um, uh, virtual meetings. So, um, Representative Hausman, I guess, can you just briefly explain for us um, what were the problems? What is wrong with the compromise language that was adopted by the Senate? Chair Hausman. Well, that was compromise language in the Senate. We haven't found our compromise language yet. So, um, I think that's a fairly simple question. Mm. Well, Representative Garofalo. Well, look, Madam Chair and Representative Hausman, the the language that passed out of the Senate had bipartisan support. There was 45 votes. Obviously, you you swapped that language out. What what was wrong with that language? That the compromise is always very hard, right? So, it's something that we want to encourage, not discourage. At this point in session, what was wrong with that? What were the what were the disagreements that well, uh, House, the House, House DFL members, had, your House, the House and, DFL uh, had with that language? Madam uh, Speaker, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Uh, Representative Garofalo, that did not include any House members in its conversation. So it's certainly it was conversation in the Senate, but I think you understand that um, House and Senate have separate conversations. Sure. And Madam Chair and Representative Hausman, I appreciate that. But on the substance of the bill, what are the what are the parts of it that are that are not acceptable to House members? Since I have not had any, uh, Madam Chair, since I have not had any opportunity to uh, invite House members to be part of that conversation. Uh, we haven't had an opportunity yet to indicate what, what we would agree to and what we would not. Okay, uh, well, Garofalo. so Madam Chair and uh, uh, Representative Hausman, um, so uh, again, I uh, appreciate that fact. And uh, I will tell you that when I look at this issue, my primary concern is that it looks like the DFL is using the temporary crisis of the COVID uh, situation, situation to try to make permanent changes in Minnesota law. Uh, that they're trying to leverage that. And so for that reason, Madam Chair, I'm gonna ask for a move of reconsideration on the substitution of this language. Um, and I would request a roll call on that. The reason, uh, Madam Chair, and this is primarily uh, as a result of, we're now at the point in the legislative session where uh, we've got the fighting out of the way, you know, we'll have the health and human services debate on the house floor uh, today, there'll be more fighting. But this is a time for the chambers and the governor to start moving towards one another and start reaching conclusions on these items. And in this area, um, the eviction moratorium, there is real damage being caused to, to real families. Um, I received an email this morning from a constituent. Uh, his first name is Bob. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to give his full name. But this is Representative Hausman. This is what he wrote to me. He said, Pat. My father is in a nursing home. We are out of funds to pay for his care and need to sell his home to cover cost of care. 
The problem is we can't evict the renter out of his home due to the emergency order. Is there an exception to Governor Walz's emergency order that allows us to remove the renter? Now, my understanding of that, the answer to that question is no. Uh, there are some exceptions to the governor's emergency order, um, but this is a situation that we're seeing across the state where people are unable to sell their homes. Uh, they have people who have had a uh, a, a lease that's expired in the, in the, I guess I didn't know, I didn't get the memo on the landlord versus housing provider uh, terminology, so I'll use the term housing provider. But to my fundamental question here, is it, is it, is it, fair to say that the DFL is using the temporary COVID crisis to try to force a permanent change in Minnesota law? Uh, Chair Houseman. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Garoppolo, uh, I will tell you the most unsatisfying thing to do at this particular point is to, to frame this in a partisan way. Representative Garoppolo. Okay, I appreciate that the description of it may be unsatisfying, but uh, is it accurate though? Um, from this member's perspective, that's the way things look, is that um, I look at the underlying bill that is, uh, we'll be voting on the reconsideration here now. Uh, I look at that and I don't see any way there's any bipartisan support for that. Um, this is moving us backwards away from reaching an agreement, something that we have to accomplish. Um, I will tell you that yesterday I had conversations with staff when I saw what was on the agenda, and I talked to a couple of members on our side of the aisle, and I talked to staff on our side of the aisle, and I said I was genuinely confused by what you guys were doing. This doesn't this doesn't make any sense to be backing away. Uh, you you know I expect the House would make some changes to the Senate language. Uh, you know take the Senate language and make it kind of you know. Uh, more in more in line with objectives, but to completely wipe out the language that 45 members voted for in a contentious issue that's been going on for over a year, it just it struck me as very odd. And I do not I do not understand uh, the play here on this. I don't understand the uh, not only the legislative strategy but the substantive um, substantive reasons for blowing up uh, what has a what was a bill that is moving towards bipartisan agreement. Um, Representative Hausman, I, I've, you and I have known each other for, gosh, this is it's our 17th year I've known you. Wow, it's, I realize it's been a long time. I feel like I know you, uh, know you well, and I know that you understand um, legislative history and where things are going. But um, this is, I mean, this is kind of an unusual move by the DFL, uh, the House DFL, that is, uh, to do the, to marginalize an agreement and to start up a new fight on this. Um, I would be surprised if there are 68 DFL votes for this bill, but I guess I wouldn't be shocked. And um, if there's if there's any insight you can provide me either privately or publicly, um, our side of the aisle is confused by what you guys are doing on this in blowing up uh, and backing away from the table and what have been some honest, uh, good felt efforts towards a bipartisan agreement on this. So I'll be, uh, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be voting in favor of reconsideration and I'll encourage members to do the same. Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Houseman. We have not been at the table yet. Here's the way our process works. The Senate passes a bill and the House passes a bill and we meet in conference committee. That's when we're at the table. At this point, the House has not been at the table or any part of the conversation. Here's just one issue um, that um, uh, you may recall when, when the um, budget bill came, I talked about the fact that 43 states provide some sort of eviction notice. We are one of only seven states that provide no notice, uh, that a, a tenant has no opportunity to prepare to uh, either um, get current on their bill or to find another place to live. That's one of the, that's one of the ongoing discussions that we uh, will continue to have in conference committee. Okay, so it, Madam Chair, that's our concern is that again, um, rather than lifting the eviction moratorium, we're seeing members try to use the COVID crisis as a tool and leverage for making permanent changes in Minnesota law. And this is this is this is not a good sign. This is this is concerning that if if uh, if that's what uh, some members are going to be relying on is trying to change change permanent law in an effort to have any changes in these emergency orders. This is a very, very disturbing trend, and it signals that the emergency powers aren't going to be going away anytime soon. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Okay, um, Chair Garofalo, um, so my, my question to you, um, I'm sorry, Representative Garofalo, my question to you is, um, uh, if did you vote for substituting the language originally? Madam Chair, I voted on the prevailing side of the motion. You did vote for that. Okay. All right, that's, that's good to know. Um, so my question is, um, well, we have other questions, so why don't I go to the other questions before we go to move forward? Uh, Representative Nash. Um, Madam Chair, I can wait with my questions for after the mo uh, motion is reconciled, because I believe we do have to deal with Representative Garofalo's motion to reconsider first, unless I'm incorrect. Um, Representative Scott. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I'm wondering if maybe nonpartisan staff could give us some direction on if what Representative Nash said is accurate. I think that when there's a motion on the table, you have to address that before you go um, on with any other discussions. But I'm wondering if nonpartisan staff could help with that. Answer that question, Madam Chair. To the nonpartisan staff, can you give us some Madam clarity Chair. on whether we need to move with the motion before we go to other questions? And Madam Mr. Chair, Mr. members, Mr. this Sullivan. is Colby, House Research. Um, you know, I think if, if members want to speak to Representative Garofalo's motion, then of course it makes sense for the chair to call upon the members and give them a chance to speak. Otherwise, I think it's probably the chair's discretion uh, when to move to the to vote to reconsider. I will note under House rules in committee, it's not necessary for the member to have voted on the prevailing side in order to reconsider. That's different uh, from the protocol on the floor. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. So is, is that your intent then, Madam Chair, is to have discussion before voting or is the, re is the discussion gonna be limited just to the motion or is it to the substitute language of the bill as it stood as adopting the DE? My original, uh, Representative Scott, my original thought was that we would have this discussion, but um, why don't we just move for the reconsideration of, of, of the language to the bill? All right. So, Thanks, Madam Chair. And then I'll have questions after that then. Okay. So why don't we move directly to the reconsideration of the bill? Um, and let's do a, a roll call on the reconsideration of the bill to uh, Madam, Ms. Mark. Madam Chair, the... Ms. the Ms. Sorry, the uh, motion to reconsider can be a voice vote by the committee. I believe the roll call that Representative Garofalo was requesting would be on the motion to substitute the House language once we have that motion back before us. Well, Madam Chair and to House staff, I am requesting a motion on the, I am requesting a roll call on the motion to reconsider. Oh, okay. Um, and if I, could give a, if I could give a closing speech on that, well, I'm, some of our members maybe wanted to highlight the differences between the two languages, the, the language that was in the bipartisan agreement and the language that's in the House file. Um, they can feel free to do that, but I would like to give a closing speech before we vote on it. Why don't we go ahead? Uh, Representative Garofalo, to you. Uh, thank you. Um, so, Madam Chair and members, as I mentioned in my uh, earlier, um, it's always hard to reach compromise, right, especially in this polarized, highly political environment. And so whenever we have an opportunity to work together and move towards agreement, it's a good thing. Now, I'm not saying that the Senate file is uh, the language the Senate passed is perfect. Certainly there are some clunkers in it, but there really is no reason for us, and it's no reason for the House DFL to take that agreement and not use it as a basis for further agreement, to take it and completely replace it with permanent changes in housing policy that are leveraging the COVID crisis, it really is the wrong thing to do. Now, um, as I mentioned in my previous comments, our side of the aisle doesn't understand what you guys are doing. And in reaching out to stakeholders uh, in the, um, the uh, housing providers, uh, to use that term, uh, speaking with members of both sides of the aisle in the Senate, no one knows what you guys are doing and why you're doing it. Um, this is very reminiscent of the COVID-19 agreement we had last year on distributing local funds where out of nowhere, the House DFL just showed up and blew up what had been a four-party agreement. Um, 
I just we're we don't understand what you guys are trying to do. And at this time where we have less than a month left in the legislative session, uh, to be going on a a hard bend left to be backing away from the negotiating table, this is not the way to wrap things up. And rather than a tool for having this be addressed in conference committee, this is just setting up a sequel of what happened two years ago. This is a step towards setting it up so that we're going to have a leadership tribunal. We're going to have one member of the House, one member of the Senate, and the governor writing all these bills and then coming back and telling people what they have to vote for. This is a, this is a symptom of a bigger problem, and, and this action is going to help facilitate that, not, not with a, in a good, collaborative, positive manner, but rather in a negative and reactive manner. So, Madam Speaker, or Madam Chair, and members, I would encourage members to vote for the motion to, to reconsider, so we can have a more, a more thoughtful debate. So we can use the uh, the steps that have been taken, the compromises that have been taken place, that we can build off that for final uh, a bill that will be agreed to by the House, the Senate, and the Governor's office, and take a step away from this brinksmanship uh, and uh, polarization. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. Um, so with that, members, what I'd like for us to do, we're going to do a roll call on reconsideration of the language that we just voted to move on. And so, Ms. Markman, please take the roll on the reconsideration of the language. Chair Moran? No. Moran, no. Vice Chair Olson? No. Olson, no. Representative Garofalo? Yes. Garofalo, aye. Representative Albright? Yes. Albright, aye. Representative Becker Finn? No. Becker Finn, no. Representative Bernardi? No. Bernardi, no. Bernardi. Representative Eklund? No. Eklund, no. Representative Hansen? No. Hansen, no. Representative Hassan? No. Hassan, no. Representative Hertoss? Yes. Hertoss, aye. Representative Hornstein? No. Hornstein, no. Representative Johnson? Aye. Johnson, aye. Representative Kresha? Kresha, aye. Kresha, aye. Representative Liebling? No. Liebling, no. Representative Lilly? No. Lilly, no. Representative Mariani, excused. Representative Marquardt? Marquardt, no. Marquardt, no. Representative Miller? Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Representative Nash? Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Representative Nelson? Nelson, no. Nelson, no. Representative Noor? Noor, no. Noor, no. Representative O'Neill, excused. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, no. Pulowski, no. Representative Petersburg? Petersburg, aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Pinto, excused. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Representative Schultz? No. Schultz, no. Representative Scott? Aye. Scott, aye. Representative Sundin? No. Sundin, no. There are 10 ayes and 16 nays. So there have been 16, um, 10 ayes and 16 nays. The motion does not prevail. We will move forward with the House language. Uh, Representative Nash. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Disappointed that we were not able to reconsider, but I do have some questions uh, for the author of the uh, House House language, and I'll start off with this. Um, you know, I, I I guess I'm just stymied by what really looked like permanent changes or an on ramp to permanent changes here. You know, in a time when landlords have been effectively uh, prohibited from making changes much like Representative Garofalo shared in his intro. Um, I've had a similar similar story. One of my close friends uh, owned a townhome. They wanted to sell it. The person that was residing there knew that they wanted to sell it. They had an active buyer, and uh, the person had initially said, well, um, I don't really want to move, but I will. And then they completely dropped the plow and said, well, under the, these rules, you can't evict me even though you have the ability to sell it. That's problematic. We're now dealing with people's real property. We're dealing with their livelihoods. 
and we're making it so that they're not able to utilize their properties in a way that they see fit, which seems exceptionally counterintuitive and un-American. But, uh, you know, I guess one of the principal concerns that I have is this, that uh, right now the, the housing providers or landlords uh, have been told that they cannot raise their fees, their rent, if you will, um, if they had a rent increase last year, and House uh, nonpartisan can can clarify this for me. But if they if they had an, a housing increase last year, they may not lay a new rent on the table in front of the the renter this year. Uh, and I guess I would ask either the the bill author to clarify that or to corroborate that or House nonpartisan because that's troubling. If they had a rent increase last year based on the morphology of the bill, they cannot have a rent increase this year. So I guess that would be my first question among many that I have, Madam Chair. Your Hausman. <clears throat> or nonpartisan. Um, can we get some clarification from nonpartisan staff on whether or not landlords can increase, cannot increase rent was there like a timeline of 60 days uh nonpartisan staff Ch chair and members this is mary mullen uh with house research on page two of the bill uh there's a provision that says the landlord is prohibited from increasing the rent for residential tenancies more than six percent and in no case during the application of the peacetime emergency can there be a rent increase if the rent increase was if it happened once in the previous 12 months so while the peacetime emergency continues, um, you would not be able to increase the rent, say this year, if you're talking about 2021, if you did increase it in the 12 months previous. Oh, uh, Representative Nash. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And that, that makes one of my points is that Chair Hausman is now saying that uh, even though you had a rent increase last year, if you uh, are trying to have a rent increase this year, which is not abnormal for people in a yearly lease, they, they do see rent increases uh, year over year, um, you can't do it. So you can't manage your property uh, on your own. You have to turn to uh, the government and uh, bow down, kiss a ring, and, and you're now told that you're not able to manage your property uh, in the way that you see fit. And Chair Hausman is the one that's bringing that, that policy forward. So uh, that's troubling. But more troubling is that this creates, from my reading, uh, a, an impairment of contract that the, the person who signed the contract is now um, not going to be held accountable uh, to the language that they signed in the contract, but the landlord is. So uh, if Chair Hausman would please let me know how she plans on, on uh, actually sticking up for the, the, the people who are the, the renter or the, the landlords. Um, this is, a, this is an, a, just a complete infringement of people's constitutional rights. They, they are entering a contract with somebody who signs that they are agreeing to the language. But now, uh, because of what Chair Hausman is putting into this, that... Uh, you can't collect late fees, you can't, which is something that is in the contract. You can't collect late fees, you can't evict people. Uh, I understand that's from the governor, but you're trying to continue that out. So maybe you could under, help us understand, Chair Hausman, what, what the rationale there is. And Madam Chair, I will have some other questions. Uh, Chair Hausman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we are talking about the transition. During the peacetime emergency, how do we keep stability during the peacetime emergency? It hasn't ended yet. Uh, one of the things um, that um, Minnesota Multi Housing has testified to uh, over and over is they have been surprised at how high the, uh, the rent payments are, that the, that the crisis in non-payment of rent isn't as great as they thought. So um, all, all of our indications are, are that we have managed a certain amount of stability just perhaps because of the housing assistance that we pro provided. And um, so th that's this bill is all about keeping things stable during the peacetime emergency, which we're still in. Well, well Madam Chair, 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Madam Chair and to Representative Hausman, you're, you're actually talking about making it so that they can't have an increase during this totality of time. Um, what if they have an increase in their costs that the landlords are carrying right now? You're prohibiting them from, from uh, doing this with a now apparently year-long off-ramp. Uh, that's, that's, that's problematic for me. Um, you know, here's, here's what I will also point out is that Chair Hausman said in her intro that she wants to, to prolong this in order to get housing assistance plugged in. And the CHAP program or COVID housing assistance program that was brought in last year, um, we've gotten information from uh, multiple sources that the injection of that money, which I believe came in in December, uh, people were applying for it, actually didn't get sent to landlords uh, until not just a, um, a handful of weeks ago. So the the 60 days that are being provided is is kind of a, uh, a token offering because it's going to take longer than that. Certainly the state government and federal government don't move that fast. Very, very concerning. Um, but I guess the, you know, my, my problem is that beyond the procedural um, shenanigans that were pulled just a little bit ago, uh, people who own these properties are not able to manage them in the manner in which they see fit. And that is troubling. Uh, again, I have a lot of a lot of friends that I know that are landlords, and they have a tremendous relationship with them. But in a couple of examples, if somebody has just effectively chosen to ignore paying their rent, they are going to be, and I believe this is in the bill, uh, they're going to get a, a notification. Well, that official notification is now sort of a, an official notification to them to stop paying altogether. So if you're already behind, let's say 30 days and you get that 60 day notification, well, now you're going to effectively deprive the landlord of an entire quarter of, of rent by the time you're fully dislodged from their property. That is very troubling. You're now going to, to effectively destabilize uh, their portfolio. They're going to make it so that they cannot uh, be able to cash flow. And if, if that happens enough times, they're going to be unstable themselves, but there's no, no provision, no allowances for them in this bill at all. It's effectively a very renter heavy bill. And I'm just really troubled that we aren't considering the, the, the people who own the property. We're just holding a gun to their head saying, well, you're now going to do this and you're now going to do that. And we're not going to sit down and, and listen to you. You know, the the insertion of the house language is sort of an official declaration of, well, we don't really care what the landlords think um, because that was reached during comp with compromise. This is not. Um, I, I just find this whole effort very, very troubling. It is it is a trampling of the constitution. It is, it, it's saying to people who entered into the contract, the renter gets all the benefits of the doubt and the rent, the, the landlord gets nothing. Um, you can't raise your rent. If you raise it last year, house partisan, nonpartisan staff confirmed that you, people will not be able to increase the rent to tenants at all this year. So thanks for that. Um, I, I just think this is an exceptionally troubling bill. It is not reflective of a partnership or a willingness to work together. It is hyper-partisan, and I hope it dies a fiery death. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, okay. Uh, I do want to remind you know members who are part of this um, hearings that we are still in a peacetime emergency, and there are like thousands and thousands of people who are not working, not because of their own, but because of the pandemic because of a pandemic, you know, and so um, we have to make a choice about, you know, whether or not we are going to exacerbate the amount of people who are homeless. You know, we have been very generous as a state to really support and advocate for landlords to make sure, and I, I know it hasn't been easy for landlords nor tenants, but we have stepped up. And so has the federal government to help landlords. Um, I, I just felt a need to say that, 
you know, that has a ripple effect of not only in housing, but also in our educational system for families, you know, for children. And this just can as really make things so much more worse if we have landlords at this point when people are not have not gone back to work to say that we're going to also increase the rent on folks who have not yet been able to go back to work. Uh, we <clears throat> have something in place. So what I want to do here, you guys, is that um, we have three other um, members who would like to speak to the new house language that is, for, yes, that is trying to stabilize our state. Um, and so I'm going to go on and ask a couple of questions from each of, uh, uh, of our members who would like to speak to the new house language and, uh, and, and, and move this forward. So I will start with Representative Scott. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, my questions are for the bill's author, Representative Hausman. And um, my question, my first question is, is there anything in this bill that requires a tenant to apply for this emergency assistance? I look at all the money, the federal money that has flowed into the state of Minnesota for emergency assistance, 100 million through the CARES Act, 375 million from the CAA, and then another 152 from the ARP. Um, that totals $627 million. So my question is, what is there anything in this bill that requires a tenant to seek emergency assistance or to seek after these dollars? Representative uh, Chair Hausman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't know if Minnesota Housing is on this call, but um, I heard from the commissioner already last week. We have now the new uh, process set up for this uh, additional uh, federal money coming in overnight. I mean, they look, they literally just watched these applications flow in thousands already. And uh, again, I, um, um, Madam Chair, I don't know if Minnesota housing is on to, to give that number, but it is a staggering number. We don't have to convince anyone. They are coming by the thousands applying for this federal aid. Um, Madam, uh, Madam, Madam Chair, thank you. Well, Representative Hausman, I don't know if you received an email. I don't know if this, this particular housing provider um, emailed everybody or not. Um, it was somebody that wasn't my constituent, but I did get an email from this gentleman a couple of weeks ago and he talked about how he has a, a house that he's renting out and both people have worked the entire time through this pandemic and they have not paid him a dime of rent. So under your bill, if I'm not mistaken, people could go a full two years two years without paying a dime in rent. Representative Hausman, how do you expect, you know, let's say for round numbers, a person pays a thousand, their rent is supposed to be a thousand dollars a month. How in the world are they ever going to get caught up if they're behind $24,000 on their rent? Will these dollars that are flowing in from the federal government Will they cover all of that $24,000 so these people just walk scot-free? And under this bill, there's no requirement that they seek public assistance or yeah, public assistance um, for their rent. There's no requirement on here that they have um, lost their jobs. Uh, Representative Housen, I'm at a loss. Please explain all of this to me. Members, um, nothing, Mr. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, um, members, uh, nothing uh, removes the responsibility for tenants to pay the full amount of rent owed. I have enough respect for the people of, of Minnesota. If they know all they're doing by not paying their rent is their debt gets higher and higher and higher, I have to tell you, I have way more respect for the average Minnesotan to know they would not do that because they would know there's, there is going to be a cliff at some point. And uh, I just have more respect for them. Uh, members, what this bill tries to do is balance, uh, put some balance to the power dynamic between the landlord and the tenant. In the state of Minnesota, for years, we have done very little in tenant protection. Uh, this year, we're talking about tenant protection and the, and the backlash has been huge. 
uh, to that to, to those efforts. And I, I keep going back to one example. 43 states provide some sort of notice of eviction. We're one of only seven that does not. So Minnesota has not been doing anything in the, in the area of tenant protection, and this is some attempt to balance that uh, power dynamic. So Madam Chair? So uh, Representative Scott. <clears throat> Thank you. So what I'm hearing the bill's author say is Representative Grossman. One moment, Representative Scott. Sure. Um, in my opening, in my last statement, I, I wanted to share that I was going to have two questions each from each member to ask questions. The purview of this committee is around um, the fiscal part of this. This is a conversation that was ha had in housing, but I wanted to give members at least an opportunity to um, to ask questions. And so I think you're at your two max. And we have Representative Petersburg, and we also have Representative Hurtosh. Well, well, Madam Chair, if I could just push back on that, this committee—you're right—it is fiscal, it is fiscal parameters. But this committee voted to inject itself in there by changing policy. We have, we have made, we made a policy-based amendment on this bill. So, I, I appreciate that if we were up against a, a hard timeline here, the floor session's not till 11 o'clock, Madam Chair, and so. Uh, these remote hearings make things more difficult for you, but I see no harm in making sure that members of both sides of the aisle understand the consequences of this bill. Again, we are the calendar is open until 11 o'clock. That's a two-hour committee hearing for a, a bill that is having a huge change in housing policy. Madam Chair, it's your committee. You can run it the way you want. I see no harm in allowing members to have a more informed discussion on this before the floor session. Yes, uh, thank you, Representative Garofalo, for that reminder around time. Uh, and yes, and you're correct. I, I we did inject some language, uh, policy language into this, and I do want to remind, uh, and I do want to give um, our Republican members an opportunity to talk about that uh, language. But again, you know. Um, I do would like to also give members, other members, an opportunity to uh, ask questions. And so I don't want to spend too much time on just one member asking a huge amount of questions to only have the next member do the same thing. And so, um, and it's okay. It's okay that we do not agree with the language. I do understand that, that you know, um, in, in this body, we have a lot of landlords who want to support landlords. I myself, live in a district that uh, there are plenty of landlords. And, you know, we've also created opportunity for landlords to get money from the state and from the federal government. And I haven't had this abundance of uh, uh, emails that come to me, which I would expect I would if landlords were being truly harmed here. But I have not had an abundance of email from landlords in my district. Um, and I'm going to make some assumptions that because that they have been able to tap into the federal dollars and the state dollars that we have been so generously, generously given to landlords uh, in this time of a peacetime pandemic. Um, so with that, what I would like to do, Representative Scott, is I would give you another question. Then if we have time, we will come back to you. Um, All right with other questions. So go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. And I'll just wrap up with these comments. You just made the case that Representative Garofalo was making before that what is being happening here and, and Representative Hausman, Chair Hausman alluded to it too. You want to make permanent changes. This isn't just about the pandemic. And this isn't just about the peacetime emergency. You want to codify into law some of the ch some of the changes um, that the the governor made in his peacetime emergency declaration in the um, executive order, and members um, to say that it's been so generous of the uh, federal government to give landlords money. Let's be realistic here too. Uh, the Minnesota Multi Housing Association has said there hasn't been that big of an uptick in in evictions and people not paying their rent, maybe a 5% increase. So what you're doing with this bill is you're creating a year long off ramp that's gonna probably require another off ramp, an off ramp for the off ramp, because people are gonna be so far behind potentially on their rent 
those that do want to be, abuse the system. And Representative Hausman, I have confidence in most people, they'll pay their rent, but there are cases where they're not doing that. And this isn't, this isn't about the landlord getting what they need or the tenants, you know, and it's an uneven playing field. This isn't what this is about. This is contract law. This is about the DFL coming in here and trying to change permanent law under the guise and under the um, shiny object over here, which is the pandemic and the peacetime emergency. So members, I would encourage a, a no on this vote and we'll, I'll look forward to more discussion on the House floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, <clears throat> thank you, Representative Scott. We do have a hard stop at 10 o'clock. We do have session at 11 o'clock, but as you know, members, we also going to caucus. Uh, I don't, not sure what the Republican uh, caucus is doing, but the Democratic caucus will be caucusing at 10 o'clock. And so with that, we do have a hard stop to take a vote at 10 o'clock. Um, Madam Chair, we do not have a hard stop because of a DFL caucus meeting. This committee meeting started at nine. Again, I want to, you obviously, it's your committee and you have the flexibility to run the committee how you want. But the DFL getting together to, the, to meet in a private meeting, that is not a hard stop. Well, this committee, Madam Chair, this just started at 9, 9 a.m. Yeah. Limiting so, it to one hour for a substantive change in House policy. Madam Chair, I don't think that's that's appropriate. Representative Groffler, I'd just like to also remember, remind the members that adopting language that has been moving through the House in the Housing Committee is not really adopting new language. We're moving language that has been vetted here in the House, in the Housing Committee. But Madam Chair, it is also replacing consensus bipartisan language that moved, moved us towards an agreement. We're this in is the a House. We do what we do in the House. We do not have to agree with the Senate. This is language that has been moving in the Housing Committee. Right, but Madam Chair, the minority party is under no obligation to agree with the DFL. Just because you guys want to do something doesn't mean we have to sit down, be quiet, and shove rags in our mouths. Yeah, we're not asking a seriously you to problematic that. issue. Representative Groffler, we're not asking you. To, I'm not asking you to do that. But you we, are because you're terminating the committee meeting in nine minutes. We do. All we're asking for is the ability to highlight these concerns. We understand you guys have the votes, and you're going to pass it. This is a seriously problematic issue. We're simply asking that you not artificially limit the meeting to one hour. So, uh, members, I do want to remind us that because of our previous passes of the housing omnibus, this committee has already voted on the fiscal element of this bill, which is our primary jurisdiction. To the extent that the members wish to discuss the policy of the bill, that conversation will be best held on the floor. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and to uh, the author of the uh, um, amendment here and, and the bill, I'm confused because I, I think I hear differing uh, information from you that at least I don't understand. It sounded like uh, you said that this bill amendment was trying to deal with uh, the difficulties in evictions and so forth during the peacetime emergency when I thought this bill only dealt with after the emergency. The other thing that you said was that the reason for the 60 day notice was so they have time to access for the assistance. But uh, then later you said, well, they're ac accessing it right now. So I don't understand why they can't access it now. And, and why are we dealing with something that's supposed to be for the pandemic during the emergency for 12 months afterwards? If, if I could get some clarification there, I'd appreciate that. Sir, uh, is that Madam, Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, they are yeah. applying right now. It takes a while with that massive number of applications. It is simply going to take a while for Minnesota Housing to process those applications. So they're applying, but um, the the process of, of uh, accessing those funds is going to take some time as as they process those uh, thousands of people. Okay. Um. So, so if I could have my second question, if you're going to limit us to two. Yes. Uh, thank you. So, so that just kind of brings the, to the point uh, that really um, they know now whether they're in trouble or not, and, and they could be accessing it. I'm not sure why 60 days later, and it, the bill also doesn't indicate whether or not six months after um, the pandemic ends or the, the executive orders ends, somebody loses their job, they could end up with 60 days after that for no reason concerning 
the pandemic itself. But my second question is in regards to section three, when it talks about the court beginning an investigation, to me, it's unclear as to when they need to do that. Do they do that after the 60 days or do they do it when it first starts, uh, et cetera? Because obviously we know that court investigations can take, well, anywhere from 60 to 90 days additionally uh, before they can make that, um, that investigation. So that's kind of unclear to me as to when the court would make that investigation and maybe uh, uh, Chair Houseman can clarify that for me. Chair Houseman. The um, uh, Senate language, by the way, I'm told um, by somebody who just contacted me, also makes permanent changes uh, to the governor's emergency powers. So um, there, there is still some clarity we need to get there. Um, I, I think you're asking a technical question that perhaps um, Mary Mullen, our house research uh, staff person, might want to speak to. Ms. Mullen. Chair and members, um, I think the question is about section three of, of House File 12. The court has to conduct an initial review of eviction filings. This would be done both during the peacetime emergency and for the 12 months after the peacetime emergency. And they would be looking for to make sure that the filing complies with the requirements of this bill so that the action hasn't been filed, isn't an improper eviction filing. Um, you know, various different types of evictions are allowed under Section 1 during the peacetime emergency, and various uh, different kinds of evictions are allowed under Section 2. So the court would be reviewing um, an initial eviction filing as it comes in during that period of time. And it would apply to, you know, any eviction that's filed. Representative Hotas. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Hausman. You have mentioned that Minnesota is among the outliers with regard to providing tenant protections. And I'd like to just point out that tenant protections are provided, all tenants in Minnesota, within the four corners of a contract, and that's called a lease. What we're doing here is socializing the for rent private, <laughs> privately owned housing stock in Minnesota. Housing stock that does not belong to the state of Minnesota. Members, your actions really are promising to move private capital away for the long term from providing additional housing stock and future housing stock. The consequences of that are going to provide less future stock decrease the supply of resulting stock, which will ultimately result in surplus demand with less housing stock, which will reflect increased rents and higher housing costs, which is moving away from affordable housing. Liquidation of this existing stock into the, of the owner-occupied housing stock will be a result of this action. Members, tenants who are delinquent have had notice under their existing leases and it's called a contractual deadline. 60 days notice to simply extend the expiration of any executive order by two months. This does nothing to protect tenants or landlords for the long term. Everything you're doing is exacerbated the affordable housing crisis for the long term. And members, lastly, it promises to tighten the mortgage financing and the capital or supply for those who have been willing to take a risk and be a housing provider. Why would anybody under these laws be incented to create more private rental market? All that's going to happen in the end members is you're gonna, we're gonna see a, a liquidation of privately owned rental stock, which will become owner occupied rental stock, particularly in townhouses and single family homes. This is a tragic development. Members, uh, please vote no to this. Thank you. Representative Groffalo, would you like to do your closing statement? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I wanna highlight for you and members of the DFL, um, the reason why we are bothered by the fact that you're terminating this meeting right now is the DFL has been using the House rules to stop us from debating these items. So
so the Senate language that was adopted, we can't even offer that as an amendment on the House floor now. That'll be blocked under the DFL's uh, interpretation that it's not germane because it has Chapter 12 changes in it. So if you're wondering why we want, we're having this discussion now, it's because that was your guys' decision. You won't let us have the debate anywhere else. So I, I do, Madam Chair, I understand the difficult job you're, you're, you're having here. Limiting this to one hour really isn't that, – that's not fair, and it's not appropriate. Um, regarding the subject of the bill, what we're seeing right now is, unfortunately, the black helicopter conspiracy wing of the Republican Party is being proven right. People who have said, you know, this emergency authority, walls in the DFL are never going to end it. They like the emergency authority. Think about it. The emergency authority accomplishes what? It allows people – you can't evict anyone for not paying their rent. Well, as long as the emergency authority is in place, that's going to continue. What else do they want? They want, a, they want um, moratoriums and limitations on what landowners and la um, landlords and private property owners are able to do in terms of terminating leases in terms of bringing in new clients, in terms of modifying, uh, working with people to modify leases, it eliminates all their authority to have control over their property. So the reason why this debate today is so important and the reason why this bill in replacing compromised language with partisan left-wing policy, the reason why it is so disruptive is it is validating people's concerns that the DFL are never going to let this emergency end. This emergency authority isn't going to be going away anytime soon. We said this last year that the concern is that Tim Walls is going to keep this emergency authority until Election Day. And the actions you guys are engaging in today is further evidence that you are looking to build a case to keep this emergency authority in place until November of 2022. This is concerning. It is disruptive. And it's something that people need to have a higher level of awareness on. The bill you're voting on today moves us away from compromise, agreement, and resolution to these issues. And so, Madam Chair, for that and many other reasons, I would oppose. I would encourage members to oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ruff, Ruff, Representative Garofalo. <clears throat> I would just like to state that by no means we want this pandemic, this peacetime emergency, to continue on. You know, we would like to see you know people continue to, you know, to receive vaccinations, wear their masks, social distance, wash your hands, all the things that the CDC recommend that we do so that we can get past this pandemic and go back to a regular life. That's what we really, really absolutely want to do is to go back to normal life. We're you're like, you yeah, we're tired of this, you know, but there's a process, the pandemic, COVID-19 showed up. And because it showed up and killed over, a, well, I believe over half a million people, it's why we're in this position right now. It's why people are not working. It's why individuals are not able to really pay their rent. It's why we put protectors in place so that people would not be homeless on the street further spreading uh, COVID-19. And members, I just want to remind us again that, you know, the House Ways and Means is the fiscal element of, of the legislature. And because of our previous passage of the ho housing omnibus, this committee has already voted on the fiscal elements of this bill, which is our primary jurisdiction. So to the extent that I have allowed members to discuss it, it's way beyond our preview, preview, pre preview in this committee. Preview. I just pre preview. Thank you, Representative Hotas, that I, I knew you would show up for this. You know, um, it is beyond what was really allowed in this committee, you know, and this, this conversation is best really been held on the House floor. And so with that, members, uh, Vice Chair Olson renews her motion that Senate File 1470, as amended, is recommended for placement on the General Register. Ms. Sparkman, please take the roll. Chair Moran. Aye. Moran, aye. Vice Chair Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo? No. Garofalo, no. Representative Albright? No. Albright, no. Representative Becker Finn? Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund? 
Uh, Representative Hansen? Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hassan? An aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Hertos? Of course, no. Hertos, no. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Johnson? No. Johnson, no. Representative Kresha? Kresha, no. Kresha, no. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Mariani? Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquardt? Marquardt, aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Miller? Miller, no. Miller, no. Representative Nash? Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson? Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative O'Neill, excused. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Petersburg? Petersburg, no. Petersburg, no. Representative Pinto, excused. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Schultz? Schultz, aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. Representative Sundin? Aye. Sundin, aye. Representative Eklund? Aye. Eklund, aye. <coughs> there are 17 <coughs> ayes and 10 nays. There have been 17 ayes and 10 nays. The motion prevails. Senate file 1470 as amended is recommended for placement on the general register. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Houseman, for your leadership.